So good evening, everyone. First, let me thank Dr. Efren Balanag, our uh, president, for giving me this opportunity to share with you the nutritional needs of neurologic patients. So as to the outline, of course, in any case that will be given to us anthropometric measurements first, then what are we going to feed these patients? How are we going to feed them? And I will discuss briefly with you one disease entity that's uh, related to neurologic impairment, and that is your gastroesophageal reflux disease. So going back to the case, the salient features, so RS, a three and a half year old, still had occasional head lag. He was carried by his mother with his anthropometric measurements. His abdomen was scaphoid. There was no mention if he had an NGP tube or there was a peg tube on the abdomen. There was no feeding history given, but his extremities were spastic. He had regular bouts of cough and colds almost every other month. And this is the present working impression. With determining the weight, it's the usual thing that we do. So standardized techniques and equipment. So if the patient cannot stand, if you have your bed scale, table scale, chair scale, or a wheelchair scale. However, if you do not have this equipment, then it's the usual thing. No? So meaning the mother with the child will stand on the weighing scale and then the weight determination done. Then the mother will pass on the child to another person. Her weight will be determined and appropriate subtractions, then you get the weight at plot. How about for the height? So, so this is the challenge because some of the neurologic patients, they have scoliosis or contractures on the hip, knee, or your ankle. But we do have alternate height measurements like you have your knee height, your tibial height, and your arm span. And these alternate measurements can either be plotted on corresponding charts or you convert to height using your corresponding formulas. So for the alternate height measurements, so you have your knee height. So you measure the right or the less affected leg so the patient can still be seated or lying supine with the knee and the ankle at 90 degree angle. So you place the blade under the heel of the foot and you place the other blade over the anterior surface of the thigh across the condyle of the femur, just proximal to the kneecap. Then the value that you get, you just uh, use this formula and the answer to which is the, uh, the height measurement that you will get and then plot on the appropriate growth chart. Another height um, alternate measurement, you have your tibial length. So the patient can still be seated or in a supine position, but this time the right leg will cross over the left leg just above the knee. Then you measure from the medial joint line of the knee to the distal edge of the medial malleolus. The value that you get, so using this formula, the answer to which that is what you're going to plot in the growth chart. Then to the third alternate measure, so you have your arm span. This time, it will require two people to complete the measurement. So there's a rod at the back, then you measure, so the extended tip of one middle finger to the other. And using this formula again, so the answer to which you plot on the appropriate growth chart. Now, there are other measures of your nutrition status. You have your mid-upper arm circumference and your skin fold measures. You have your tricep skin fold and your subscapular skin fold. For cerebral palsy, there are appropriate growth charts for this. No? So it's just like in Down syndrome, we usually do not use anymore the WHO growth chart, but we use the Down syndrome growth chart. Same thing for your cerebral palsy. So clinical growth chart, cerebral palsy, that is what you type and these growth charts will pop out. And one thing good about using this cerebral palsy growth chart is that there are further classified, so gross motor function classification system. So you have five and going straight to the case of RS. So he belongs to group five, transported in a manual wheelchair. Actually, he was not using a wheelchair, but he was uh, being lifted by the mother. So we use the group five. So plotting it, so this is the cerebral palsy growth chart. So RS is three and a half years of age with a weight of 8.8 .8 kilograms. So we have it here. Uh, his percentile, it's 10th percentile. So that is his weight. 
and for the stature for age percentile, so his length is 72 cm and it falls on the 10th percentile. So the question now is, what if we're going to use the standard WHO growth chart? Are we, go, are we going to get the same interpretation? So again, if we're going to use the cerebral palsy growth chart, his weight for age will fall on the 10th percentile. On the right, if you're going to use your WHO growth chart, look at where his weight will fall. It's way below the third percentile. No? So, halos wala na siya sa growth chart. Are we going to have the same interpretation no, for your height? So, using the cerebral palsy growth chart, so stature for age percentile, his height will fall on the 10th percentile. However, if you're going to use the WHO growth chart, look at where his height will fall. Way, way, way below the third percentile. No? So, halos wala na siya sa growth chart, di ba? Parang kung sasabihin mo dun sa nanay at ipapakita mo tong growth chart na to, para mo na rin sinabi, ano siya, singaw lang, di ba? Kapag kayo nang ginamit mo. And that is because if you will recall, your WHO growth charts are based on children going in optimal conditions and appropriately. No? So, dehado medyo ang mga children who have cerebral palsy because for one, we already know that their height cannot bear for children. No? Kasi, diba, especially for those who are not mobile, so there's no pressure on the long bones, which is a requirement for growth. So the next question is, what are we going to feed these patients? And as you can see in this picture, this is still a reality. Some parents would chew the food and that chewed food is the one that's going to be given directly to their child. So if there are no issues on absorption, on tolerance, on allergies, then the usual polymeric formula can still be given. So when you say polymeric formula, intact ang protein mo, you still have your complex carbohydrates, you have your corresponding calories. In fact, some of them would have the one is to one ratio, so one calorie to one ml. So examples of which, no? so you have your breast milk, your usual infant formula, your blenderized formula, or your energy formula. However, the, the things that we face with, though, with regards to those who have neurological impairments, specifically with cerebral palsy, nagkakaroon ng problema sa feeding and swallowing. So how will we know if indeed you are encountering this problem? So these are the guide questions. So first, how long does it take to feed your child? If it's more than 30 minutes on any regular basis, so perhaps there's a problem on the lip closure, there is a problem on biting, on chewing, and swallowing, then indeed there is a feeding or a swallowing problem. Next question. Are mealtimes stressful to the child or the parent? If yes, to one or both, this is another red flag sign. Next. Is your child gaining weight adequately? Is there a lack of weight gain over two to three months in the young child, not just weight loss? So another red flag. And are there signs of respiratory problems like gurgly sound? Is the child choking? Is the child um, having these changes of color while feeding? Then these are red flag signs. So you know that indeed there is a feeding or a swallowing problem. So if the answer to those questions are yes, so the thing that would come up, uh, come up in your mind would be, what then are you going to feed this patient? How are you going to prepare this food item? So we have this guideline. So the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative or your EDC. So it provides a common terminology to describe food textures and drink thickness. So it's a continuum of eight levels. So that's zero to seven. Drinks are measured from levels 0 to 4 and foods are measured from levels 3 to 7. So when you say regular food items, these are the usual food items that we eat, that we consume. So there is no issue on the food texture or the food consistency. No? So it's the normal everyday foods of various textures. But when we say easy to chew, 
So, they're the normal everyday foods of soft or tender textures. No? So, yung kung naalala ninyo, di ba, yung chips ahoy, right? So, you have the regular chips ahoy and there's the easy to chew no? or the soft um, chips ahoy. Okay? However, is it the right easy to chew that we can give to these uh, patients who have feeding or swallowing problems. So how will we know if a food item is indeed easy to chew? So using the side of the fork or the side of the spoon. So if you want to split that food item, it must be able to break the food apart easily. Or using the fork pressure test, so to make sure the food is soft enough, you press down on the fork until the thumbnail blanches to white. So looking at your thumbnail, it's colored pink, right? If you use that thumb, put pressure, look at the tip, it changes to white. No? So yun yung ibig sabihin ng thumbnail blanches to white. Then you lift the fork to see that the food is completely squashed and does not regain its shape. How about the soft and bite size? No? So, yan ang usual na sinasabi natin. Eh, diba? Kapag ka meron kang uh, feeding, biting, or chewing problem, we just say na, pigyan mo lang ng mga soft food items. But how soft is soft? No? So, for soft and bite size, biting is not required, but chewing is required. And the food piece sizes are designed to minimize choking risk. The tongue force and control is required to move the food and keep it within the mouth for chewing and oral processing. And tongue force is required to move the bolus for swallowing. So again, to be able to say that it is soft, so the thumbnail again blanches to white and the sample squashes and does not return to its original shape when pressure is released. But how small is that bite size? No? So, hindi ito yung usual na binibili nating bite size na chocolate, di ba? So, sa atin kasi pag bite size, basta kasya sa bibig natin, bite size na. No? But of course, this, not, this does not hold true when we deal with patients na may neurologic impairment. So, bite size, so for the pediatric age group, it's as small as 8 millimeters. So, syempre, hindi naman kayo kukuha ng ruler uh, para i-measure no, yung 8 millimeters. So, approximately 8 millimeters is P size. Sa adult kasi, it's 15 millimeters ang allowed sa kanila. So, when you say 15 millimeters, approximately, parang peanut ang size nun. So, how about for the minced and moist? So, this time, biting is not required, but minimal chewing is required. Tongue force alone can be used to separate the soft, small particles in this texture. And tongue force is required to move the bolus. So, when pressed with a fork, the particles should easily be separated between and come through the prongs of the fork. And the size now is just 2 millimeters. So, kanina bite size, it's 8 millimeters. So, it's as small as a pea. So, pag minced and moist, it's very, very small, 2 millimeters. So, gano ba kaliit yung 2 millimeters, no? It's uh, approximately the size of the tip of a new crayon, no? Yung Crayola. Yung tip of a newly sharpened pencil, the size of that is 1 millimeter. So, ito, 2 millimeters. Now, for the extremely thick, if tongue control is significantly reduced, so you give your extremely thick for here, uh, for this one, there's no biting or chewing required and increased oral and or pharyngeal residue is a risk if too sticky and any food that requires chewing, controlled manipulation or bolus formation are not suitable. So how will we know if the preparation is extremely thick? So using the fork, you put that food item on top of it. So there will be a mound or a pile that you will see above the fork. And there's just a small amount that may flow through and form a short tail below the fork, but it does not flow or drip continuously through the pork prongs. Now using the spoon, you do the tilt test. So looking at the pictures with the pink plate, so as you can see, if a small amount will be retained on the spoon when you tilt it, this is the one that is allowed. But looking at the four bottom pictures with the white plate, wherein a significant amount is still retained on the spoon, then this is not extremely thick. 
How about for the moderately thick? So no oral processing or chewing required. It can be swallowed directly. So if tongue control is insufficient to manage mildly thick drinks, it allows more time for oral control and needs some tongue propulsion effort. So moderately thick or liquidized. So for the fourth drip test, so it drips slowly or in dollops or strands through the slots of a fork. So, mas malaki na yung drip niya. And so, you cannot eat this using a fork. So, spoon na. For the mildly thick, if thin drinks flow too fast to be controlled safely, these mildly thick liquids will flow at a slightly slower rate and may be suitable if tongue control is slightly reduced. Now, for mildly thick, this time you do not use a spoon or a fork, but you use a syringe. So you remove the plunger, cover the tip of that syringe, then you pour the food item, then you release the timer, uh, you release the nozzle and start the timer. So stop at 10 seconds. So you say that it is mildly thick. If the amount that will retain in the syringe is 4 to 8 ml, then you know that you have the right preparation. How about for slightly thick? So this is often used as a thickened drink that reduces speed of flow, yet is still able to flow through an infant nipple. It is thicker than water and will flow at a slightly slower rate. So using again your syringe, so you remove the plunger, cover one end, then you pour the drink, you time it. So after 10 seconds, if the amount that will retain in the syringe is less than half at 1 to 4 ml, then this is a slightly thick preparation. And then for the thin, so it flows like water, so fast flow, you can drink through any type of nipple, cup, or straw, so the functional ability to safely manage liquids of all types. So using the syringe again, and after 10 seconds, if the amount that would be retained in the syringe is less than 1 ml, then this is a thin preparation. In most cases of cerebral palsy or those who have neurologic impairment, they are really undernourished. No? So once we already know the type of food that we're going to give, how to prepare them, so the next question would be, are we going to supplement them with micronutrients? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. So we have here the different micronutrients with the appropriate dose. So you have your vitamin A, your folic acid, the zinc, copper, iron, magnesium, and potassium. A number of studies have said that uh, cerebral, cerebral palsy patients are also deficient in calcium and vitamin D. And this is not surprising, especially so for vitamin D, because they are not really exposed to sunlight, especially for those who are non-mobile. So how are we going to give now these food items? We know already on how to prepare them. So we have your enteral access devices. And these are dependent on the length of time tube feeding will be necessarily, it's necessary. So this is dependent on the functional status of your gastrointestinal tract and whether the patient is a candidate for surgery. So your enteral access devices, devices, so it's either the gastric route, so the usual nano, so the gastric tube or gastrostomy tube, or the woodenol or jejunal route, so the nasal the woodenol tube or your nasal the jejunal tube. For your gastric route, so this is to provide nutrition when food cannot be taken by mouth. It takes advantage of your normal digestive processes and hormonal responses. So the method that it's either intermittent or continuous. For duodenal or your jejunal route, so it provides continuous nutrition. So you cannot give it intermittently or by bolus. So uh, they cannot tolerate gastric feeding. So that's why you have to get, give it continuously and uh, they experience difficulty with inadequate gastric emptying and intractable vomiting. So nasogastric, this is the usual thing that we do encounter. So this is the thing that we usually uh, use not to give the food items or the liquid to our patients. It's the simplest and most widely used. It's used for less than three months of feeding and uh, there's less distortion of your gastroesophageal sphincter. However, it can cause mucosal irritation. It's easily dislodged when the patient 
vomits. No? And if you're going to use the usual NGT made of polyurethane, so after three days, you have to change it. But there is already the tube, no? um, make niya, or it's made of silicon, so siliconized NGT, it can really stay there for as long as a month or around six months, no? although it's more expensive. Now, just to give you a tip on how to uh, determine the gauge no? or uh, anong French yung NGT na gagamitin. No? Sometimes the nurses would ask us, Doctor, anong French ang gagamitin dun sa pasyente na ilalagay na NGT? So, always remember the number 16 and then you add the patient's age and you divide it by 2. So, for example, if the patient is aged um, 8, no? so 16 plus 8, so that's uh, 24 divided by 2, so 12. So you use French 12 NGT, okay? So next for the tube enterostomy, so you make an opening now directly on the abdomen. So the usual thing that we use is the gastrostomy, so percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. So what are the indications for your gastrostomy? So need for a long-term feeding, so more than three months, no? Or if there are permanent or progressive swallowing dysfunction, or hypermetabolic state or congenital anomalies involving the face. So the methods of, ad of administration, it's either you give it by the bolus no, or intermittent or continuous. So for bolus feeding, the advantages are it can mimic or supplement meals. So ito yung usual na natin, no? we eat using no, the method of bolus feeding, hindi continuous. However, the disadvantage is there is an increased risk of aspiration, but there's freedom of movement in between feedings. It may not require a pump. It is not recommended for those with issues on gastric emptying. No? So if you're going to uh, use the bolus feeding, since naiipon yung pagkain doon, prolonged ang gastric emptying, mas lalo magkakaroon ng aspiration. For continuous feeding, the advantages are, so this is the preferred uh, feeding for small bowel feedings. It requires a pump and so infusion may improve tolerance. What we usually do is that during the day, it's intermittent or bolus feeding and then at night, it's continuous feeding. However, overnight feedings may result in morning fullness. So let's discuss briefly one disease entity that's highly associated with uh, cerebral palsy or those with neurologic impairments. So gastroesophageal reflux disease. So our patient RS in the history, he had regular bouts of cough and colds almost every month and was hospitalized twice due to pneumonia. If you will recall the red flags for your GERD or your GERD recurrent pneumonia and upper airway symptoms, and these are present in our patient. So as said, no, so there's a high prevalence, around 50 to 75 percent of children with neurological impairment do have GERD, and the causes of which are there's low muscle tone, so it relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, some of them could have scol uh, scoliosis, abdominal spasticity, or the positioning during feeding. So non-pharmacological management in children with GERD there should, no, uh, there should be no smoking or no household member who smokes because the nicotine then um, leads to a relaxation of your LES. What are the food items to avoid? Your caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, or peppermint because it relaxes your LES pressure. Avoid acidic food and drinks like your colas, orange juice, and spicy food. Those food items that are high in fat, like pizza, french fries, because they slow gastric emptying. Pharmacologic management, we have your H2 blockers and your proton pump inhibitors. In surgery, when do we resort to this? When everything has failed, your, uh, um, your medications are not working, then you could already refer for your Nissen von duplication. So going back to the outline, what I discussed with you are the anthropometric measurements. So using the appropriate growth chart, so in this case, cerebral palsy, there are alternate measures specifically for those for the determining the height and then the issue on what to feed. 
if there are no issues on tolerance, on absorption, or allergies, you just give your usual food items. But if uh, you're dealing with feeding or swallowing problems, you may be guided using the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, or the IDC. And of course, if your patient has un uh, is undernourished, micronutrients, micronutrient supplementation, I discuss with you the route, mode, and method of delivery of the food items. And gastroesophageal reflux disease and the food items to avoid. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention.